All right, I see some new faces here, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Victoria Vesna, chairing the Department of Design, Media, Arts, and I'm responsible for bringing in these strange subjects into areas of culture, art, and design. Um, thank you. Uh, this is a particularly uh, exciting evening for me um, because of the timing. One of our graduate students, Ruth West, sitting right there, was a geneticist for seven years before she decided to change her career path. And we had a conversation thinking and talking about all the different artists that are starting to think about genetics with the uh, mapping of the code and the kind of profound influence that has on all of us in our society and most of all in our perception of self. So she sat down and uh, put together a class called Genetics and Culture. We proposed it, and last week she got a letter that was accepted. So I'd like you to give a hand to Ruth for <laughs> breaking the kind of a cultural barrier. The class will be open to a campus-wide group of students, and the idea is to introduced to artists and anybody who's interested in the creative field dealing with digital media into the concepts of um, what genetics are, how it works, but also what artists are doing in the field for scientists and create that kind of dialogue. Anyway, with that, I'd like to move on to our first speaker, Chris Lee who is particularly intriguing to me personally because of his background. He's one of the uh, new kids on the blog that comes from being with a computer from his childhood, kind of assembling computers and being just absolutely fluid with that language, and then moved on into bioinformatics and started a company of his own in Silicon Valley as early as 93. Uh, so, this mix of biology and informatics to him comes quite <coughs> naturally. Excuse me. Uh, he is on the board of the scientific counselors of the National Institute of Health, and last year received the MIT Technology TR100 award. His current research focuses on analysis of the human genome and its variation the diversity that makes us interesting. Please help welcome Chris Lee. Well, thank you for that a very generous introduction. Um, so uh, what I thought I would do here is um, give you a kind of view from the trenches, if you will, um, in uh, how we're working with the human genome. And um, the question that I wanted to kind of start with was uh, this idea of uh, you know, how many human genomes and, and whose human genome. Because uh, you know, if you think about it, that is really sort of the, the question. I mean, there's a human genome that's supposedly been sequenced. And uh, actually, if you go back through the data, um, about 70% of it is actually from uh, I think only one person. So somewhere <laughs> there's somebody going around who can say, you know, well, that's, that's my genome that uh, you're all making a big fuss over. Um, but you know, if you were to kind of look at even just that one set of data, there's a question about, you know, is it really all just one genome? Is it uniform? And um, as I'll be talking about tonight, uh, the, the answer is absolutely not. Each person has two copies of the complete uh, genome. And of course, even between those two copies within one person, there are enormous numbers of differences. How many differences? Well, um, let's say that about one in a thousand letters is different between any two uh, chromosomes that you compare an exact match between the, the say, two copies of chromosome one. And with a genome of about 3 billion letters, that adds up to about 3 million differences between you know, me and you. Um, so what are all these differences? Well, 
Um, at, at some level, they're the thing that makes us, you know, makes a human being unique. That there's an individuality uh, encoded into um, this, you know, very unique, if you will, barcode of three million, uh, if you will, uh, zeros or ones. That is to say, um, the differences that I'm talking about are mostly what we call uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which means there's only a single uh, letter that is changed. And the vast majority of these so-called uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short, there are only two letters observed at that position. So it's literally, like in a computer, it's zero or it's one, and that's, that's all the choice you get. Um, so imagine a barcode, if you will, of about you know, three million of these um, zero or one uh, differences um, comprising a very significant fraction, maybe you know, 90% of um, the measurable differences between any one person and another person, this is going to add up to a lot of interesting stuff. And the difference is that um, everything I just said about two or three years ago was kind of nice academic talk. You'd say, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, there's be all these differences. Because we didn't have the differences. Now we've got them. All, you know, something like uh, one and a half million of them um, actually cataloged down to the individual letter position on the uh, mostly complete human genome sequence. So we've basically gone in a couple of years from essentially nothing to essentially everything in our, at least at the level of pure, just observational data, um, being able to track down all of these, these differences and start to uh, think a little bit and, and, and study um, what they actually mean uh, to humanity on a number of, of levels. Um, so what I'm going to do here is give you uh, experimentally a um, view from the trenches that is as, as real as I can make it. That is to say, um, I'm not going to baby talk um, and, and, and give some kind of, uh, uh, if you will, tr tremendously watered down version of uh, what genomics is about. I'm going to try to give some of the real flavor of chaos and confusion um, that is the reality of the field. I mean, this is a thing that's happening very fast. Um, just to give some sense of that, you know, it's, it's hard for me to think back to um, before the release of the current version of, of the human genome data set. Um, a conference that I was at, uh, it was end of January, where I, I first heard all these results, to me, is, is just ancient history. I mean, I can barely you know, think back to um, what it would be like to try to do the, the work that we do now minus that data. So let's see, that was April, uh, February, March, three months worth of time, and basically uh, almost a lifetime in terms of how, how this field is moving um, in, in, a, in just a pragmatic, real way. I mean, the data that I work with today just didn't exist. Um, so just a couple of definitions before we get off and running. Um, the field of genomics, which you've probably heard uh, the word bandied about, is basically the idea that um, instead of studying a tiny little bit of uh, an organism or its genetic blueprint uh, at a time, we will attempt um, to study the whole thing all at once. Ideally, this means that you can actually, um, in every sample, in every experiment, every time point, read out a set of data that covers the full genome. Um, and there, therefore, every piece of data that you look at, you know, you've got information about the whole genome that you can compare. And you can start to see all sorts of things going on that would be completely invisible if you were sort of shining a flashlight in you know, one tiny part of a huge cave or you know, big dark room, which is the way that science has proceeded up until this point in time.
you could literally only look at, say, three or four genes at a time um, in a single experiment. Um, now, suddenly, we have the ability to basically work with 30,000 genes at a time in each individual sample. You know, a student would have a series of plates, um, say, 384 well plates, um, in which they're maybe processing a series of samples. Each one of those samples would then go through a process, uh, for example, like a DNA microarray, where you have arrayed as little tiny dots in a space about that big, um, let's say, probes for the, the 30,000 genes, human genes that have been defined so far. Um, you would actually measure 30,000 numbers, one for each gene, in every single one of those samples on each one of those 384 wells on each one of the, whatever, 10 or 12 plates that the student might work on today versus another set of 10 tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's an attempt based upon actually a lot of technology to be able to measure a lot of things really fast um, with a lot of automation because you don't want individual people to have to sit there pipetting over and over again 30,000 times just to look at one sample. Um, and it also obviously comes with intellectual baggage. That is to say that um, how you think about the world changes. When you used to shine a flashlight on you know, three or four genes, one tiny little portion of the room, to suddenly just turning on the lights and seeing the whole room. You switch from a totally reductionist point of view, which is the way that science has, has worked very successfully through molecular biology, to um, a point of view that is um, on first principles uh, attempting to see large-scale patterns. Um, so it's, it's, it's really s switching to a, a holistic point of view. Um, just, just to use a word, genomics is basically the technology that just generates, generates these data. Lots of numbers, lots of letters. Bioinformatics is the field of making sense of what the meaning of all these data are, which basically means using computers, because only in a computer are you going to be able to store and analyze so much data. Just to make sure that we're all starting from the same point of view here, um, you're undoubtedly aware of DNA, um, the genome, as a blueprint, um, the individual pieces of the DNA that um, scientists typically focus on as the most important parts are the individual genes. As I mentioned, people now believe there are about 30,000 individual genes. Each gene is basically just a short program that encodes the construction of one protein, which goes out into the cell and is essentially a small chemical machine that will do one very specific chemical reaction, probably in concert with a number of other proteins encoded by other genes. And the whole thing is a big get-together of all of these proteins made by all these genes that together are going to carry out the biochemical functions like copying DNA, generating energy, generating muscular force um, that the cell needs performed. And this, you can think of this as being organized into a whole series of pathways of regulation or carrying information, for example, to notice that an infection is present in one place has to lead through a whole series of events to the initiation of an immune response and a whole series of cells migrating to the right place and starting to um, attack that infection. Um, so broadly speaking, there's a flow of information from the program, in other words, the genome and the genes, up to higher and higher levels of structure, proteins, activities, pathways. So. Um, what people are actually doing in genomics pretty much just follows that program. That is to say, the very first thing that scientists have done is just try to read the program. That's what the big fuss is about. Just sitting there stupidly sequencing DNA. A, T, A, G, G, C, A, T, G, C, A. It's as boring as that three billion times over. At the level of the genome, there's a kind of a naming of parts problem. Figure out what all the genes are. 
and then go to higher and higher levels, we're still stuck, I would say, in you know, early stages of all these different levels. Um, so these are the kinds of things that people are doing, sequencing whole genomes. By now, there are about 100 genomes that have been completely sequenced, human being just one of them. Most of those are much smaller genomes, for example, bacteria that um, cause disease. People are very interested in them. You know, we wanted the whole genome for each of these to try to understand how they cause disease, what makes it um, one variant of the bacterium pathogenic, that is to say it actually infects and causes a disease, versus another variant that doesn't. So um, now what I'm going to do is start to talk about um, more my field of work, which is the area of so-called polymorphism. Polymorphism just meaning multiple forms, this idea that there's more than one genome. We all are different, um, and uh, now we start to have the ability to really understand these differences, first of all, at the stupid level, by just cataloging them. What are the differences? So um, most of the differences are what I told you before, these so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, where a single letter is different between me and you. Um, there are other kinds of differences that get uh, more and more complex that are less common. I'll just mention that sometimes these um, differences can be at a very large scale. For example, say that this were one entire arm of uh, a chromosome. Thanks, Greg. Um, and uh, so maybe this would be, I don't know, 30 million letters long. Um, you can have all sorts of things happening during evolution in which you see one whole region basically being flipped around. So it used to go A, B, C, D, E, and now it goes A, B, D, C, E. Sometimes you see something just getting completely dropped, like a whole massive region just vanished and it's gone. This frequently causes a disease, as you might imagine, because when you lose a whole bunch of your functioning parts, uh, you can be in big trouble. Among other reasons, that's why we have two copies of everything. Um, so this, it's been shown that uh, frequently this leads to uh, cancer, uh, unregulated growth of, of cells. All sorts of complicated changes that people have, have cataloged. Um, so as I mentioned, maybe one uh, SNP per thousand letters, these SNPs, um, because they are the most common form of polymorphism, are probably responsible for much of what we consider to be us. That is to say, the individuality of, of each one of us. And this has been shown at a variety of levels. For example, um, the dawn of the age of molecular medicine really came with the realization that a single letter change somewhere in the DNA, all by itself, could completely explain a disease. And that moment occurred um, early in uh, uh, the, the middle of this century. Um, with the discovery that um, a single letter change was responsible for um, uh, the uh, hemolytic uh, diseases such as sickle cell anemia. Um, and so a whole series of diseases, you know, literally thousands of, of, of different kinds of, of uh, individual mutations have been demonstrated to cause diseases as, as uh, divergent as things like breast cancer, many different forms of cancer, cystic fibrosis, Alzheimer's, etc. So clearly, at the level of disease, SNPs matter. I mean, these things are causing human diseases. Um, and obviously, people are now very interested in trying to identify these, these uh, actual SNPs that are actually causing uh, diseases. Now, um, here with a rather complicated scientist-style slide, um, I'm showing you that actually um, it's much deeper than that, that SNPs are not just things that kill you or make you sick, they're things that tune you up and down in a whole variety of different ways. So what this data shows is basically a binding curve for different uh, naturally occurring um, uh, behavior modifying compounds, um, if you will, drugs, um, that uh, are binding to a particular protein that is basically um, a receptor for opioids, um, in other words, for drugs. Um, and there's a mutation um, at one particular location, the 118th residue in this protein. Um, and you can see that the mutation has basically no effect 
the curves are exactly the same for uh, all three of these different compounds, but then there's this one compound, beta endorphin, where suddenly the mutant binds the drug tightly um, even when there's threefold less of the drug uh, actually available. In other words, a person with this mutation is going to be three times more sensitive to this drug. Okay? So you can imagine immediately that this is part of how you know, all the different quantitative aspects of human behavior and physiology are kind of tuned up and down by, you know, just like a machine, setting the set point at which the thing turns on, just set it at a, at a lower transition point. So you know, this person is going to be much more sensitive to the drug. You can imagine all sorts of things like this that could lead to um, someone being more prone to drug addiction, uh, et cetera. How do mutations occur? Well, if we just go down to the kind of micro level where we have um, an individual so-called base of DNA, you'll recall the DNA is double-stranded. That means each strand has a complement that matches it through T matches A, C matches G. And um, one of the common types of mutations that can occur is we can lose one of these tiny atoms from this chemical group, and suddenly this looks a lot more like this than uh, the original. It's supposed to be a C, but suddenly it starts to look like a T. And this kind of reaction actually can occur. It's called deamination. And then now what we have is something, um, instead of C, we have something that looks like uh, this base called U. This can either be repaired. There are all sorts of enzymes that are constantly repairing this kind of damage. But very occasionally, what can happen is the wrong repair reaction, in which the U, instead of being put back to the original C, gets turned to a T. And now, when this is copied in the future, the error will be copied as well, and you've got a mutation. Now, um, mutations are not necessarily bad things. We are built of mutations. Our diversity, everything that's interesting in biology, has been generated through a gradual process of change. You have to have change to make anything new. There's lots of new things on this planet of which we're just one, but it all came from this process of mutation that I just described. So um, now if we look at just any two people, um, we're going to see large numbers of SNPs, say about 3 million. If we look at um, a whole bunch of people, say all the people in the audience, we'll find more SNPs, the point simply being there are some SNPs that are so common you see them you know, in, in just about uh, any pair of people you look at. There are other SNPs that are less common that you only find if you look at 100 people. There are other SNPs that are incredibly uncommon that you only find in a million people, et cetera. And one of the interesting aspects of this is this question of history. Where did each one of these things come from? And the amazing uh, reality is that most of these polymorphisms are due to a single mutation event in one person at one point in human history. In other words, everybody who has this particular SNP is the child of one person going way, way back in history who, in whom this mutation occurred. So another way of saying that is that SNPs are something like, you know, three million individual recordings of human genetic history that tell you who is related to who going back all the way, even before um, what we would call the branching of the, the human species from, from other species. And this detailed recording has a lot of information in it because, of course, when that mu original mutation occurred, it didn't occur in a vacuum. That person already had a bunch of SNPs in the surrounding neighborhood, if you will. And so if we were to look right at that moment in time, this brand new SNP C has just been created. We will never find C except in the context of A, B, D, E, and F. In other words, the SNPs that were right next to it in the genome of the person in whom the mutation occurred. As we go on in time, that island of linkage to neighboring SNPs will gradually be whittled down to a smaller and smaller and smaller island of linkage.
basically because there's a process of recombination that's constantly coming in and uh, mixing and matching, if you will. Basically, it just it's one point within the chromosome. It randomly will cross over to uh, the accompanying region of the other copy that you have. Okay, so in other words, this will be clipped off, and the accompanying part from the other copy of the chromosome will be put in its place, randomizing these markers with respect to our marker of interest. But of course, that happens more and more as you go further and further away. The closer you get, there's very little space in which that, muta that crossover event could have occurred. So it becomes less and less frequent, which basically means the size of the island of linkage that you see today is a measure of how old this SNP is. You can measure whether this is something that just happened, because you can see it's basically linked to the entire chromosome, or if it's linked to, to a very tiny region, it says it's very, very, very ancient. And the ancientness of these things can actually be measured and quantified very exactly. So this is a vast, vast recording of the origins, migrations, and mixing of the world's peoples. Um, we can actually, for every single one of these SNPs, we can say how old it is. We can see who's related to who, by, basically by who has this SNP. And we can also see what the genetic background of the person who originally had this SNP and is the ancestor of all these people, because we can see the genetic fingerprint of the surrounding SNPs that are linked to it. And we've got millions of these. And we actually have them today. And we actually have, in a computer, each one of these individual pieces of information. So obviously, some of these are very recent. And for example, you can see that they um, are probably after the separation of different uh, groups of people migrating, say, from Africa to uh, Europe or to Asia. And you can see that in the fact that they're found preferentially in one ethnic group rather than another. There are other mutations that are much older. And actually, this is very common, um, where you see the same SNPs in basically all human populations, all ethnic groups. And there are even mutations that are older than the separation of the human species from other species. In other words, you go look in the chimpanzee genome at the exact same place as the, the SNP of interest, and you find that same SNP in chimpanzee. Human, chimp, we've got the same uh, polymorphism at that site, basically because that polymorphism is older than when chimpanzee and human uh, separated. So one thing that I want to emphasize is this is a very recent phenomenon. That is to say, as of, say, two or three years ago, well, there just there just wasn't any such data. Um, and uh, this kind of got kicked off with a, a paper that discovered about 3,000 SNPs in a consortium of drug companies, which I'll, I'll describe in a, in a, in a moment, uh, began to uh, try to find lots and lots of SNPs. I'll explain why in a moment. This slide is obsolete. There are now about 3 million of these um, individual pieces of data, which I'll just abbreviate as ESTs, which are basically little samples of sequence from genes from different people. And this has been generated by a sequencing procedure that you could think of as basically shotgun. In other words, it's just random. You randomly pull out lots and lots and lots of pieces of DNA from different people, from different genes. You don't even worry about what genes you're getting it from. You just sequence it. You get three million of these short, tiny little pieces, you know, just three to 300 to 500 letters long out of a genome that's three billion long. And the, this probably today represents maybe two or 3,000 people. So this is a data set that can allow you to find SNPs because it actually is a sampling of the human population. I mean, it's coming from, you know, literally thousands of people. So um, some of the work that, um, my group got involved with was basically we decided to go after SNPs using this kind of data, the ESTs, that was being generated in the public domain. And this is a very important principle of how the Human Genome Project has been pursued. That is to say that um, people made a choice early on that this data would not in any sense be kept secret. That is to say, while the human genome sequence data was being generated, there was actually a decision that um, as each individual piece of data was generated, 
within 24 hours, it would be posted onto the web so that people like me, who don't do any sequencing at all, can basically just download it for free. I mean, anybody can download it for free and do whatever they want with it, um, which has, of course, enabled lots and lots of applications of that data that the original people who were generating the data had absolutely you know, no thought that that uh, would, would be done. But somebody else said, oh, I can use this for something, something new. So this data is extremely messy. It's filled with errors in which a letter is changed to another letter. That exactly, looks exactly like a SNP. How can you tell a real SNP from just somebody screwing up, or basically uh, a computer screwing up in the processing of this data? This is what some of the data actually looks like. Each one of these lines is a single EST sequence. They've been aligned. You can see that they mostly agree. You can see that there are places, individual places, where they disagree. Um, the pattern of where things tend to disagree shows, shows strong patterns. Um, which we've used to, to figure out um, how to distinguish SNPs from, from sequencing errors. This is what some of the actual data generation actually looks like. In other words, each one of these lines, vertical lines, is a single sample, basically one piece of DNA from one person. There are just four bases in DNA. You can imagine that somebody clever could work out a way in which each one of those four bases would be connected with one color, red, green, yellow, blue. And that you could literally run the DNA out on a gel that separates it according to size so that the sequence is literally just draped out before your eyes so that I can literally read off um, from these colors. I can say, OK, red, that's A, A, A. And I see yellow, that's T. I see blue, that's G, G. I see yellow again, OK, like that. And so all this data has been put into the public domain. It's actually been measured by detectors that show you the different colors. And you can see here's a place where it looks pretty clear that there is a SNP. In other words, we can see nice, clean separation of these bands, each representing a single letter. And we can see pretty clearly there were two Gs here, and there's only one G, and now an A in its place here. So this is, this is how we figure out some of this stuff. Now, science has always been done by scientists. Scientists looking at data, drawing conclusions, coming up with possible alternative explanations, finding out what, trying to think about uh, what would explain the observations. Unfortunately, this is no longer possible. In other words, no human being is ever going to look at all these data. We're talking terabytes of data. So uh, one of the things that's happening in this process is we're basically taking what is the process of scientific judgment? In other words, weighing of evidence for alternative explanations of something that you see um, as a, an equation. It's formalized mathematically as something that you just compute. So you can think of the process of inference scientific judgment or any kind of human process of, of inf inferring something hidden from something observed is captured within a, a fundamental equation known as uh, Bayes' law, which allows us to make inferences about hidden states on the basis of things that are actually observable. So in this case, we make inferences about what is the true sequence and is there a polymorphism on the basis of seeing red, green, blue, yellow, yellow, et cetera. Um, and so we, in my lab, uh, developed a computation that actually tries to, to find SNPs um, using this kind of statistical uh, computation. And you can see here's an example of, of that. Um, here are a bunch of ESTs that are all lined. Each line is one of these EST sequences. You can see there are a bunch of places where they differ. And you can see a single place where the computation says, this looks like evidence for a SNP. We're seeing the same thing, A, multiple times, mixed with G multiple times in one of these columns, one position within the DNA. These other places it thinks are just sequencing error because it doesn't think there's enough evidence for that. That's a complicated equation. You can see there are places where you see the same thing twice, but it doesn't call it as a SNP. It ignores that, says, that doesn't look like good evidence for polymorphism. And there are you know, 
all sorts of reasons for that. Now, we go back um, to verify these things by taking blood samples from, in this case, UCLA graduate students. And each one of these vertical uh, columns is a single sample. As I said to you, there are two copies of each chromosome in each person. So we have this problem of uh, seeing two copies of everything at once. The uh, prediction here was that there was a single site that our calculation said should be G versus A at this one position. And there is an enzyme called MBO1 that recognizes the sequence G, A, T, C, and cuts. In other words, if the A is present here, it will cut. But if the G is present, no cut. Now you see the data. Here's a place where it's got, apparently, the G, because it doesn't cut, and we don't get the fragments. The vertical axis represents size. Bigger things up above, smaller things down below. When this cuts, the predicted sizes of 32 and 35 are exactly what we see down here. 32 and 35, you can see two bands. Uh, you can see it's a little fuzzy, but you can see that there are two, two separated bands. This is what real data looks like. Um, so here's a case where none of this DNA cuts. That means both copies are G. So we call that GG. Here's a case where it cuts completely. So we, all we get are the, the two fragments. That means it's AA. Here's a case where part of it doesn't cut and part of it cuts. That shows that this person has one copy of G and one copy of A. Okay? So this is how we go back and verify in this uh, rather old-fashioned method um, how uh, to detect whether these positions that we say are polymorphic can be independently be shown to be polymorphic by going to some random people and within, in this case, just 11 blood samples, finding very clear evidence that this is a common polymorphism present in most people. You can do this in much fancier ways. Um, here's an example where we use um, a company uh, called Sequinomes Technology. It's uh, called mass spectrometry. It's basically the ability to do more or less what you saw on that gel, separate things by size, and measure how much of it is there. You can use that to detect polymorphism. You can imagine that what we can do is we can make a primer that's specific to just exactly this place within the genome where we think there's a polymorphism at this letter, that it's either T or it's G. Okay, we think that this is a, a SNP, either T or G. So we make a primer that matches exactly right up to the letter, right before the, the letter that we think is polymorphic. Then we add the enzyme and nucleotides to basically copy the DNA in an extension reaction. So that would basically increase the length of this by adding new letters that match what's present in, in the DNA. But we make a trick. We throw in one nucleotide that should match exactly the A uh, is complementary to T. So if there's a T here, A will be inserted here. And we modify that A so that it's so-called DD or dideoxy basically fails to extend, extend. If A gets put here, you cannot go any further. It ends right there. So that the exact size should be just exactly what we put in plus just the A. So we know exactly what that size will be. And we look here, and that's exactly what we see. On the other hand, there's a G over in this one. So it'll keep extending all the way until it hits the first T, where it'll terminate. This is going to be longer and bigger than this one, because here it terminated at the first letter. Here it terminated at the third letter. So we get a bigger peak, a larger fragment, which we can see on the mass spec where this horizontal axis is size. And we can actually mix DNA from up to 100 people simultaneously, because we can see these separate peaks simultaneously. And basically, by seeing how high the peaks are, we can see what fraction of the mix was T versus what fraction was G. We can measure how common the polymorphism is in that group of 100 people. So doing this analysis on a small sample of our data, about 80% um, of these places that we said looked polymorphic actually were detectably polymorphic in an independent set of 90 people collected down in San Diego.
So um, this is, you know, reality. Science does not work 100%. Uh, if you're lucky, this is about how well it works. Okay, so um, why are people interested in SNPs? I've given you some maybe anthropological reasons for why people would be interested. There are also medical reasons. So um, one way of, of thinking about this medical interest is that um, obviously we all differ uh, genetically and some of these differences, as I mentioned, lead to disease. That is to say, there are some SNPs that will make you very, very sick. And people want to discover what these individual disease-causing mutations are. Um, and another way of saying that is they want to find what genes are linked to the causes of diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, etc. So the hunt for disease genes has been ongoing for, let's say, maybe 10 years and has identified um, something on the order of a thousand uh, different disease genes by a variety of genetic approaches. Um, one of the fundamental strategies is the idea of uh, markers. In other words, individual flags that are absolutely unique to one spot within the genome. You can imagine having f these flags distributed over the whole genome and looking to see which flags go along with getting a particular disease. And if you find there's one particular flag that goes to just one part of the genome and you find people who have this particular kind of cancer, they always have a special variant of that particular flag, it makes you very suspicious that basically this little part of the genome c contains a gene that's causing and a mutation that's causing this disease. And this idea has uh, been used over and over and over again successfully to actually find disease genes for a vast list of diseases that I'm, I'm not even going to begin to try to list. Um, but uh, its progress has been impeded by the fact that the markers that were available, these polymorphic, polymorphic flags, there are only about 5,000 of them over the whole genome. And uh, what that meant was when you succeeded, you were left with a really big piece of the genome and no idea about how to search that whole region for what's the actual disease gene. There could be dozens of genes in there, and it's just trial and error to say, well, I, I guess that it's this one. Well, okay, guess away, and now spend the next 10 years you know, hunting through that individual gene, trying to find some evidence, any kind of evidence, some kind of random evidence that it, it really is this gene that's causing the disease. That's a very laborious procedure. So SNPs. Um, have been greeted with some enthusiasm, basically because there are three million common SNPs over the entire genome, giving you a level of resolution in your map that peppers each gene with potentially dozens of SNPs. You've got markers that take you all the way down to the individual gene. And in fact, some of these markers aren't just markers. They are actually the disease-causing mutation. So uh, pictorially, you can picture this in the following way. Here's maybe some region of the genome. Maybe this is about, uh, say, a million letters long. Um, and in this region, you might have just two of these markers that were used previously for um, disease gene mapping, the so-called microsatellites. And you can have lots and lots of genes in between any two of these markers with SNPs. We've got a very, very dense map with you know, dozens of SNPs inside any little local interval. So if this is your disease gene, you'll be able to tell because you've got SNPs that go uh, directly with that disease gene and um, uh, easy ways of being able to tell it apart from all the other genes that are around it. And this shows a little bit of data from, from my group um, that shows that the SNP map is actually achieving this uh, jump in resolution. Here is exactly what I just I uh, told you, except that this is real. This is about one megabase, a million letters, of uh, a small region of chromosome 22, one of the smaller chromosomes in the human genome. And this region has just two microsatellites, this one and this one, that could potentially be used for mapping. 
um, in our original data set that uh, was published last year, um, every single one of these dots was a SNP that we found. Every single one of these lines was a gene that we found within this interval. So immediately, um, we're getting almost to the level where we've got a SNP in every gene. You know, uh, some presidents promise you know, a chicken in every pot. Geneticists are aiming to get you know, a SNP in every gene and be able to um, find every disease gene. So um, another reason that people are interested in these kinds of things, apart from their power for mapping disease genes, is that um, most drugs that are developed in the pharmaceutical industry through research um, are never given to patients in a real clinical setting because they fail in clinical trials. Why they fail, if we have time, I'll say a little bit about that. But um, the bottom line is that whenever you look at some group of people with, you know, for example, one particular drug, you see all sorts of differences in how those people respond. Some people, the drug will work great and you get good efficacy. Other people, it doesn't seem to do anything at all. Uh, in, in some people, maybe there are really no bad side effects, but in some small proportion of your people, you might get a hideous reaction to this drug, makes the person really sick, and basically says the conferred benefit versus the, the risk is just not worth the trouble, and the FDA won't approve the drug, even though it actually does a lot of good for, for most people, potentially. Okay? So um, now, if you had a way of being able to tell the difference between people who are going to get really sick from a side effect versus people who are not likely to get a side effect, this drug that would have failed uh, FDA uh, clinical trials actually could become approved. Um, you, what you would seek is a set of SNPs that um, correlate with the observed clinical difference. In other words, a set of SNPs that are markers for people who are going to have an adverse uh, reaction to the drug. So once again, it's the same story. You just take a bunch of SNPs and you test them in the same people that you are doing your initial clinical trials with, and you find out which of those SNPs statistically correlate, go along with, the people who show good effic efficacy. Okay, so now those SNPs are diagnostic of the people in whom this drug will work well. Of course, you might also find SNPs um, that correlate with the tendency to get really sick in response to this drug. And now those SNPs would be diagnostic of don't give this drug to that person. So um, right now, there's a massive effort within the pharmaceutical industry to incorporate the actual testing of this very large number of single nucleotide polymorphisms into clinical trials that are uh, being started for new drugs so that they'll actually be able to um, show that you know, in the past, if you had a bad side effect in 5% of the patients that you gave this to, well, that drug probably would not be approved, uh, potentially. Now, you would have data that would allow you to, di to diagnose um, which 5% of people not to give the drug to, and so now, the drug can actually be approved if you can show reproducibly that you can avoid the side effect. Of course, there's a side effect of that very research process. In the clinic, when the doctor wants to prescribe the drug, he has to test these SNPs to see whether the person is a good candidate for this drug or not, or whether they'll be likely to have side effects. So you can see that this stuff is on a path that is going to go into the hospital and will uh, no longer be just something that you know, scientists and researchers uh, think about. It'll be something that potentially could have a big impact um, on people in which, which they'll be directly experiencing actually being tested for individual polymorphisms um, before having a particular drug prescribed. And you can think of that as essentially uh, an era of personalized medicine. That is to say, um, the medications that you receive should be personalized to you because you're not the same as everybody else. And so with SNPs, we have the very beginning of the ability 
to um, actually do this because we have a vast catalog of the genetic differences between different people. How are we doing on time? Uh, how, how much longer should I shoot for? Okay. 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 So, um, so I thought I, you know, might give a few examples of uh, some things from from our work that indicate um, how this this could be used. Um, one of the things is that, um, as I mentioned. Um, polymorphisms can be completely uh, neutral markers that are simply useful as information for finding out about something else that really causes an effect, like a disease mutation. And that's a very big and important use of polymorphism information. On the other hand, um, these polymorphisms are actually you know, the vast majority of the common variation in the human population. So a lot of the actual causes of disease actually are these SNPs. I mean, there's a subset of these things that are actually making people sick. And obviously, we'd like to find those as well, um, both for purposes of genetic counseling and for purposes of uh, discovering the cause of a disease and starting to develop uh, a therapy. So. Um, one of the things that, that we took a look at was a gene that's been studied to death so that people understand its polymorphism very well and its role in disease. And basically to see how does our data help you or does it help you at all um, uh, for figuring out things like which SNPs are actually going to cause disease and can you actually identify causes of disease in this data. So the protein, the gene that we picked is um, hemoglobin. Um, this is the, a gene um, that is essential for uh, the transport of oxygen in respiration. Basically what makes blood red um, is hemoglobin um, with oxygen bound to it. It basically carries oxygen from the lungs to all of the tissues, all of the cells that need oxygen in order to respire. And lots of polymorphisms have been identified in, in hemoglobin. So we basically said, let's check what we've found against what's already known in tremendous detail because this gene's been studied so highly. So we found about, in our original search, about 20 SNPs within this one gene. Um, and one of the things that was kind of exciting for us was that actually in this you know, completely random search, we actually found SNPs that cause diseases. In other words, things that people have already shown by a, a vast amount of work actually cause a disease, and actually one of them was the cause of sickle cell anemia. So just within this random search, um, we actually identified things that cause important human diseases, making this data set something that um, is potentially of, of, of great interest. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting was that if you asked, you know, these three mutations out of the 21 total that we saw, is there anything obviously different about them? that could allow you, in a predictive way, to suggest, well, you know, we think that the, out of all these mutations, there are a subset that are likely to cause disease. Well, it actually looked pretty good. That is to say, out of these mutations, um, there are only two or three of them that caused a really significant change in um, the functional parts of this molecule. In other words, a lot of polymorphism is what uh, you might think of as silent. That is to say, there is redundancy in the genetic code. So you actually can change a letter and it produce absolutely no effect whatsoever on the protein that's going to be encoded and actually go do something biochemically. Usually, the change that causes a disease is basically something that produces a defect in the protein, the biochemical machinery, so that it fails to do its normal task correctly. And so um, what we saw was exactly what you would expect on the basis of uh, you know, the theory of evolution. That is to say, there is strong selection in evolution against bad mutations. 
What that means is most of the mutations that you see when you look at our data set, just random data that we've generated, is there's a strong bias towards these silent mutations. Most of the mutations that you see are just silent. They don't screw up the protein. Um, and there's a subset that are not silent. And in this particular case, that subset indicated very clearly uh, two or three mutations, so-called non-conservative changes. Um, and lo and behold, those were the three disease-causing mutations. So at a very simplistic level, um, this is an example of an opportunity, namely that um, the SNP information, even analyzed at a very simplistic level, starts to allow you to subset the polymorphism data into those which are likely to screw you up versus those that are likely to be silent and, and have really no functional effect, functionally neutral. So here's an example. Um, what I'm showing you here is um, a picture of the hemoglobin protein, which is basically a long chain that folds on itself to produce this complicated molecular machine. It's self-assembling. And once it self-assembles, it actually then assembles into a group of four uh, units of alpha, beta, alpha, beta, uh, which are almost exactly the same. The entire size of this unit here is about, um, let's say, let's say that's about um, 150 angstroms, which would be, um, let's see, uh, 15 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So really, really, really tiny. Um, and there would be a molecule of oxygen bound at each one of these uh, four sites. This is a mutation that we, we found, highlighted here in red on the location in the protein that it would affect, which changes an amino acid that fits right within this interface between the blue chain and the white chain, basically disrupt the fit between these two units. I mean, physically gets in the way of a nice fit between these, these units that have to fit together in order for the whole machine to work right. So um, what we saw was very characteristically that these kinds of, of mutations that were located within, for example, the interface between the alpha and beta chains um, caused disease versus things um, that were out at the surface of the protein in regions that are known not to be uh, important functionally basically silent, no known disease effect. So um, there is the prospect that over a relatively short period of time, scientists will be able to uh, subset large numbers of these mutations into those which are actually causing an effect on disease or behavior, et cetera. There are lots of aspects of this that one can, can study. Um, one point that I'll, I'll make, um, is that although we're kind of uh, conditioned culturally to hear the word mutation or mutant as you know a bad thing, um, I want to emphasize that that's just another word for diversity. In other words, differences between one person and another. And diversity is a good thing. Uh, biologically, uh, one of the classic uh, examples that we see very, very clearly within our data is that um, if you ask what are the genes that are most diverse within the human genome, um, one of the answers is genes that must play a role in the fight against infection. In other words, pathogens like bacteria or viruses that attack the human body um, are themselves constantly trying to evade our immune system. And they do that by constantly changing their code. Okay? 
In other words, um, they try to hide by changing their identity so that they're no longer recognized by our immune machinery. Well, when we look at our data and we ask what are the most polymorphic genes, just by measuring how much polymorphism there is in every gene, we find that the most polymorphic genes are those genes that are important within the immune system basically for directly recognizing and counteracting these pathogens. The explanation is fairly simple. Um, the human population has basically been waging an arms race against various bacteria, viral pathogens, you know, throughout all of uh, our history, where a new mutation appears in some bacteria or virus, makes a lot of people sick, maybe even kills a lot of people, and those people who have unusual mutations that allow them to continue to recognize this pathogen, even though it has managed to evade recognition by most people, they're the people who survive. And so there's this constant churning of the variation within the human population, maintaining an unusually level, high level of diversity. Basically, we have to be diverse to survive. And um, it's an enormous benefit to uh, the human population, for example, in our constant struggle with um, pathogens that are trying to um, make us sick. So another theme that I want to kind of end with here is just a flavor of the whole character of this research, which really is captured uh, very simply by the idea of kind of from approximately nothing to approximately everything in about two years. Um, you know, two or three years ago, basically, um, I was sitting staring at, you know, one of these alignments that I had just made of some ESTs and going, oh, you know, that column there, that, that kind of looks like a SNP. I mean, that A comes up several times. Maybe that's a SNP. Well, maybe it's not. Who knows? How many of them are there? I don't know. Uh, and now we're sitting here with uh, maybe one and a half million of these individual SNPs that have been, through a vast amount of work, individually uh, identified and, and characterized. These are common SNPs. The nature of the way in which we find them is such that we're only going to find the, the most common ones, things that are present in 10% you know, or more of people. And what we're faced with here is kind of the very interesting prospect that basically within this period of time, we have gone from essentially not knowing anything about um, the set of genetic differences that make a human being un a unique individual. That is to say, things that affect function, things that affect personality, things that affect physiology, things that affect disease susceptibility. Um, to a first approximation, um, the major, one of the major contributors to that is going to be SNPs within genes. An important uh, footnote to the genome is that the vast majority of it, maybe 99% of it, is not genes. So-called junk DNA. It doesn't code for anything uh, from the point of view of a functioning protein. It's one of the fascinating and um, uh, you know, major areas of, of, of research in the human genome is that 99% of it is um, doing something else other than actually coding for functioning genes. So actually there's a subset, a small subset of, of these mutations of which we probably have um, you know, maybe a majority in hand today and we'll get the others in not very long that are probably explaining most of the functional differences between people. That is to say, one person's going to be tall, another person's going to be short, one person will be, you know, faster to anger, another person, you know, more uh, patient, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of a, a shock, uh, even from the point of view of the people who are generating the data, because, you know, we've been busy generating data and we haven't really had a chance to really think about that very much, but basically going from nothing to everything in about three years.
and we have no idea what to do with it. Um, so my lab now, for example, is involved with a whole number of, of projects where we're collaborating with researchers, for example, in the human genetics department here at UCLA that have incredible disease gene discovery projects. Where we're basically hunting for the genes that cause these diseases, things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or different kinds of um, cardiovascular disease, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, diabetes. Um, and if the record of you know, the last 10 years in these labs is upheld, um, they're going to find it because they've already got things down to the level of a small region of the genome with a positive signal. And all they're trying to do is squeeze down to a small individual region that would be a single gene with a single mutation. So this paradox of you know, going from knowing essentially nothing to essentially everything produces other paradoxes. For example, um, you know, on some level, it looks like we know a lot. For example, um, if we were to kind of total things up, you know, maybe there's about 5,000 genes that have been studied you know, fairly intensively in the sum total of all biological and biomedical research. Um, maybe just to uh, you know, be conservative, maybe there are 500,000 papers about these 5,000 genes. Um, and uh, you know, a little three, or three to 10 page paper in a science journal may not look like much. But I can tell you, uh, absolutely guaranteed, each one of those uh, you know, three or 10 page papers is probably four uh, man or woman years of work. Um, so this probably represents about two million uh, man, woman years of, of work to get these 5,000 genes sort of characterized. Um, so maybe it looks like we know a lot. I mean, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of papers. You don't, don't want to have to go read all those papers, right? Um, on the other hand, it's less than a sixth of the human genome. So it's basically nothing. I mean, for the first approximation, that's basically nothing. If you ask me you know, over and over again, do you know anything about this gene? I'll say, no. You know anything about that gene? No. You know anything about the other gene? No. You have to ask me on average six times before I say, oh, yeah, we know a bit about that gene. So in the last two years, we got to about 90% of the genome. Um, obviously, we know very little about this additional five six that we've just acquired. Um, it probably only took a few thousand man-woman years to get this rest of the 90%. But um, this leads us to this kind of paradoxical situation where, in some ways, it looks like we know a lot. But in other ways, the reality is, as a fraction of the total, we know basically nothing. Um, and what this really represents is the fact that a human being is you know, a work of art. I mean, this incredible amount of information contained in the design of a human being. So, um, the flavor of genomics is that we are very much in fundamental learning mode. I mean, we are trying to get basics, basics down. Uh, just this question, how many genes are there? I mean, you probably heard that there was a big argument uh, where people had estimated from as low as 20,000 genes in the human genome to as high as you know, 170,000 genes in the human genome. That's a big disagreement. And the latest claim is that you know, it's going to be about 32,000. The reality is we don't really know. I mean, it's still an open question. The confidence interval is probably squeezed quite a bit, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty. The question of what are the genes, I mean, there are 32,000 somethings in a database somewhere, but are these really the right, the right things? Are they really the genes in the human genome? And where exactly are they? Um, one thing that I'll just say is that what you heard about in the newspapers is basically bullshit. Uh, the human genome has been sequenced, but the idea of what truly are genes is actually just a prediction. There are programs that people run to predict what are the actual regions that are going to be genes. And if you do careful analysis of those data, basically, more than half of it is wrong wrong on a variety of different levels, which could be from little details to 
No, that's just not a gene at all. And uh, we have a lot of work, basically, to sort these sorts of things out. This work matters because if you make a single nucleotide error in figuring out what a gene structure actually is, this can completely screw up what you would infer the protein sequence to be because basically you have to read the, the gene sequence three letters at a time in order to get your protein sequence. Leave one letter out and suddenly the whole thing is just completely shifted and it'll be completely wrong. So details matter. Um, this is not as serious a problem maybe as I'm making it out to be because there are all sorts of experimental ways now to basically say we don't have to predict anymore. We can use experimental data like ESTs to really sort out what's real and what's not. And that's a process that's ongoing now. So we're left with all sorts of really basic questions like what are the SNPs, what are the proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the good news is that having the genome will actually be able to answer these questions um, I would say, you know, uh, not necessarily with millions of man and woman years worth of work, but maybe with thousands. Um, so basically right now what scientists are really focusing on is trying to find the causes of human disease, either defects that directly cause a disease, so that would be like a single mutation that got that, mu that mutation in two copies, you get the disease, or alternatively, things that simply contribute along with a number of other genes to a susceptibility to a disease. This is probably by far the more common case. And this whole project is actually proceeding pretty rapidly. Thousands of, of uh, disease genes have been identified. Where the rubber meets the road is in the development of new drugs. And this is the last thing that I'll, I'll talk about as an application for the human genome. It's basically the uh, maybe little known fact that uh, drug discovery is basically uh, odds that are maybe no better or no, no worse than playing craps. In other words, if you were to just take dice and just roll them, you'd probably be doing about as well as drug companies, what I mean specifically is that out of the money that's spent per year on new drug research, most of that money is spent on uh, disease gene targets and uh, candidate drugs compounds that will never make it to the clinic, will never be given to a patient in an actual therapeutic setting. And the reason is the vast majority of them will fail in clinical trials, either because of side effects or insufficient efficacy. And at some level, this is no surprise if you take into account the fact that you basically don't know five-sixths of the blueprint. And it's like an engineer who doesn't know what a resistor is, or a car mechanic who's, you know, the only thing he's heard about is the distributor. He's never heard about, you know, the carburetor. I mean, how's he going to fix your car if he just doesn't know anything about cars? And Pharmaceutical companies have had this sort of heroic, uh, if you will, uh, approach in which you basically you go for the gold. I mean, you bet huge. I mean, you spend billions of dollars on research, and you do that knowing that only a small number of these things, maybe only one out of, out of you know, a project of you know, five years' worth of, of stuff, is actually going to lead to anything. So it's just this crazy process, and there's a lot of, a lot of paradoxes uh, embedded in that. Well, the genome is really a remarkable opportunity to put this behind us permanently. Basically, this inefficiency is, is because you, know, you can't tell what is going to be efficacious, and you can't tell what's going to cause side effects. And the genome, by giving us the blueprint of all genes that are involved in human disease, really is our first opportunity to um, design drugs. In other words, to approach the, the uh, problem of coming up with new therapies the way an engineer would approach the problem of fixing your car. In other words, he's got the blueprint spread out in front of him, and he says, well, you know, we know this part over here is important for such and such, and you've got this disease where the such and such isn't working, so you know, here's this candidate set of genes, and 
you know, okay, we'll twiddle this thing and we'll find out that, you know, this went up and that went down, blah, 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 ultimately it leads to a candidate drug. And in the past, you had two fundamental problems. The first, which hopefully is, is easy to understand, is that a lot of the genome is basically, uh, I won't say redundant, but highly interrelated. In other words, you might have one gene that has a particular site, which I've shown by this little square, for carrying out some activity. Because evolution never uh, creates anything whole cloth by just inventing it completely new, what it does instead is it basically copies some existing thing, makes a new copy, and then starts to fiddle with it, modify it a little bit to make something new. What you end up with in the human genome is lots and lots of things that look similar. In other words, that they, for example, would have very similar binding sites, these uh, squares. So when you, drug company, in your infinite ignorance, design a drug that binds to the square, uh, it's actually going and poisoning other uh, genes that you had no intention of screwing with and which could cause all sorts of bad side effects. Um, because you didn't have the genome, you had no idea that these things were there. You had no way of knowing. So um, that problem can hopefully be avoided now that we know the genome and we can tell what are the set of different things that you could screw up and what are you going to have to do in order to design something that will truly only go after this one target that's genuinely involved in the disease. You also have problems of a lack of efficacy where, again, you might have multiple pathways that achieve the same effect. So if you design a drug that blocks one pathway, well, it has no effect because there's still this other pathway that can carry on uh, the same function even while this one is completely blocked. So you have zero efficacy. And that problem uh, you know, arises this, even despite all sorts of testing in different kinds of, of um, artificial uh, systems that people try to mimic a disease using some cells that are being grown in, in a culture dish or maybe they'll give the drug to a rat. Problem is, you know, we're not exactly the same as a rat. So the pathways and the alternate targets are not going to be exactly the same. And so the bottom line is uh, it doesn't really work to say that, um, uh, you know, n not knowing the genome um, will not be a problem. It's a huge problem. So what I'll end on is just the idea that very slowly but progressively, um, our ability to tackle a wide range of different diseases that have so far proved very difficult, for example, like cancer, um, to treat in all of their you know, manifest forms, will gradually succumb to uh, a new level of understanding where, basically, we don't have to do things randomly and by trial and error at incredible cost and inefficiency. We'll actually be able to navigate our way through a very complicated set of problems and attempt to um, uh, identify a specific problem and provide a specific fix. I think, ultimately, you know, what we're all aiming for is uh, an era of personalized medicine. That is to say that you can make something that's truly specific to a particular problem, and then you can figure out for a particular person which flavor of, uh, of therapy is really the best, uh, the best treatment. So I'll end uh, on that note and, and take any questions that, that you may have. Yeah, I appreciated all of the information that you provided, but I was concerned that some of the statements that you made about the importance of this research for identifying, as you put it, the causes of disease was rather overstated. Um, and in particular, I think at one point you left the impression when you said that there, you know, there's a thousand disease genes, like genes that cause diseases that we've discovered. And I think what you meant to say was that, that there's been a thousand, uh, actually more than a thousand genes associated with diseases that have been discovered, but there's only a very small handful among those where you can say that there's a single mutation that 
every, every single person who has that mutation gets the disease. It's a different thing to say, as you were saying, that when you, you can look at, you can find a gene, you can find a SNP that's associated with cancer, and every single person who has, that can, has cancer has that SNP. But it's also the case that a lot of other people have that SNP who don't have cancer. And, even, and, and, and to, to go even further with that point, I mean, the BRCA gene and, you know, for breast cancer and so forth, um, even that is just an association with, you know, 50% of the people who have the BRCA gene don't get breast cancer. And moreover, um, less than 10% of breast cancer is from hereditary mutations. The kind of, you know, talk that you're giving really distorts the, I, I think, the importance of uh, genetic research for a lot of these kinds of diseases that you're discussing where there's a contribution or an association, but the language of causality is, you know, in, in terms of like a, kind of the idiomatic ways that we think about causality is probably a lot uh, stronger, you know, th th than for people who aren't familiar with this. And the, sure. the, the other final point I just want to make is that, you know, asthma has gone up in this country 50% according to the CDC in the last 20 years. You wouldn't make the claim that our genes have changed 50% in the last 20 years. There's a lot of other things that are going around. I like the image that you used of us being, um, you know, scientists being in a, in a room and at a certain point we only see a small portion and now we see the whole thing. But I'd like to suggest that in the context of disease, focusing simply on uh, genetics, even though the pharmaceutical industry has an investment in our doing so, really is still focusing on a very small contribution for, for how very complicated organisms interact with our larger environments. Absolutely. Very well stated. Absolutely true. Total agreement. Um, I was talking about genetics. Um, and as, as I mentioned on this slide, um, there is a fundamental difference between um, a mutation that has, uh, I guess, what you would call 100% you know, penetrance, such that um, basically you know, if you have uh, two copies of that mutation, that you're definitely going to get the disease. Um, geneticists, you know, recognize, uh, you know, complete spectrum of different levels of penetrance um, and a complete spectrum of different levels of complexity in uh, any kind of uh, disease or phenotype ranging from monogenic where there's a single gene that, um, you know, you can identify a single mutation that explains, you know, whatever, you know, 40% of the affecteds. Um, to you know, complex uh, disorders where absolutely um, you expect and always show that there is a um, contribution from multiple genes and multiple environmental factors such as lifestyle, uh, exposure to environmental uh, pollutants, etc. Genetics is a small part of a very large picture. Um, it is, uh, on the other hand, uh, a part of the picture that has made um, a fairly uh, unusual rate of progress within a short period of time. That is to say, a short time ago, we didn't have the human genome, and now we kind of do. So that's why I chose to, to talk about the human genome, as opposed to uh, the environmental factors, which uh, are very important, but I you know, personally don't, don't know very much about them. A well. couple little uh, remarks. Uh, yeah, I, I've lived through a period now where, uh, since before the discovery of the gene, it was uh, postulated but had not been discovered. And there's uh, one marvelous little publication uh, the uh, advance of the fungi, I believe it. I forget the, the author. Uh, in this publication, he, he speaks of the, the genes as possibly being a set of fairies that abide on the chromosomes. And they sit along these chromosomes, and each of these fairies has a magic wand and is able to confer the gift of blue eyes or the, the gift of tall uh, stature and uh, so on. And I always uh, thought that that was a, a wonderful way of thinking about something before we actually had discovered it. Uh, another uh, thing, uh, this word polymorphism, that used to be 
A terrible no-no in the biological sciences, the whole uh, idea. There was a fellow uh, back in the 20s who uh, discovered a way to beat the Rayleigh criteria in magnification. And he maintained that he could see uh, in his special microscope, which used instead of the static uh, solution to the Schrodinger equation, which gives us the Rayleigh limit, uh, he used a, a dynamic solution. Uh, in this uh, microscope, why he s maintained that he found several types of bacteria that had a, a viral expression and that these viral uh, viri could uh, uh, change into bacteria and back again. This was called polymorphism in those days, and he was uh, terribly drummed out of the core, as it were. And in fact, if you look for references to his work, they've all been deleted uh, from the abstracts, and if you have a copy of the old abstracts and you go looking for them, you'll find that people have gone into the libraries and removed the documents with razor blades. Uh, he was over here at U USC uh, many years ago. Uh, just a couple little remarks there with some historic interest. Uh, Chris, to what extent are pharmaceutical companies uh, looking back at previous trials that have failed for one reason or another, there must be many of them that have seemed to show large numbers of people that respond well and other side effects that are very serious. Is that a big area that you're aware of? And I, I really don't know, but I suspect that um, you know if there's uh, if there's an obvious win, uh, such as as you're describing, then you know people will will try to try to do that. I mean, you know, lots of things that have, have failed along the way for one reason or another, you know, have, uh, you know, eventually been been found to, to have, you know, some very specific application somewhere else. So, you know, I think think there there probably is a lot of discovery possible there. Um, can you, uh, I have two questions, uh, maybe mention briefly what is the most um, exciting part of this research and maybe one thing that is very frustrating about it? Um, well, I mean, I think that, uh, I think the whole thing is exciting in that it's, it's about being able to see larger patterns shifting from a mode where you know we were pretty much forced to look at, at very small details you know one at a time or a few at a time so I think the ability to um, fundamentally work with biological systems as information and to address for the first time the character of biological systems essentially as, as information systems. I mean, that's something that biologists have not had a good way of dealing with in the past because, you know, I mean, it's sort of trivial to say, well, yeah, you know, sure, it's an information system, it's got information in it, and it does things with information, but you couldn't really do anything with that because ultimately you could only, you know, look at two or three genes at a time. I and mean, it's sort of like looking at a big digital computer and um, all you're able to do is, is look at, you know, a single wire somewhere within whatever, you know, your Pentium processor and you can see it going on and off, on and off. So you, had, you lacked the ability experimentally to uh, do much of anything uh, pursuing larger scale patterns. And um, so, you know, you had to take a reductionist uh, point of view, um, so I think I think that there's there's a very interesting uh, time right now where you know the capabilities and uh, insights of information science 
information technology, basically computing, um, and biology are really getting married, basically. I mean, the last 50 years of science is basically physical chemistry and biology getting married. I mean, genetics is basically, you know, say, okay, there's, we're going to make everything molecular. We're going to make the gene molecular. We're going to make, you know, the protease molecular. We're going to make everything, every activity is going to become molecular. And so you have molecular biology. So the last 50 years, you could say, is sort of the marriage of physical chemistry thinking and biological problems. And I would say, you know, the big thing for the coming period is um, the marriage of uh, information technology, information science, and biology. As for frustration, um, well, I guess, you know, the biggest difficulty in this sort of field is exactly what I just said. That is to say, it's really hybrid. It's, it's not enough to know biology. Uh, it's not enough to know computer science. It's not enough to know, you know high-powered statistics. You have to put all these things together, and it's very hard to find students, hard to find people who, you know, uh, swim rather than sink when, when kind of thrown into that, that problem. So, you know, I mean, we ha all have a lot of, a lot of learning to do, which is, which is great. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's, there's a frustration that, you know, it's, it's the, the hybridness of, of the work um, can be, you know, can lead to extra difficulties. I just had uh, two two points or questions. One was, I think it was interesting that you were talking about the sort of um, ways in which uh, the sort of design aspect that the genome provides, you know, on, on the way that pharmaceuticals can approach drug solutions. And it's interesting that that, I mean, here in the context of, you know, the new newfound kind of generative arts uh, scenario that seemed a lot, of, a lot of things around here now seem to be taking on the character of providing a framework or a vocabulary. Uh, to me, it seems that the genome doesn't actually point to a very specific solution. Instead, it points to a, a framework in which then sort of iterations or mutations can, the drug company can then run through um, potential solutions. And in some, in some ways, there's this, there's this kind of um, approach that's, that's showing up in a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of creative, creative uh, 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 endeavors these days as well that seems to, to, seems to fall along the same line. So it was interesting that you used design as the word to describe that because it's another thing, another solution in design in other, in other domains is, is also to provide these frameworks or just how to have a map of frameworks and then work within them to try and generate a solution. Um, and then the other question, my other sort of comment was that you sort of said that, that the coming age was going to be a marriage of information sciences and biological sciences. And I think the key word which you forgot there, which always sort of is lurking in the back of my mind when looking at these presentations, is economics, <laughs> which, is that, which is to say that, uh, um, you know, part of what the drug companies get along with the ability now to make these generative models of the sort of solutions they might be providing is also to very effectively model the return on investment and risk and various other intellectual property issues that they might be coming up against, you know, as they, as they generate these solutions. And that seems to me a big part of where a lot of this is going is, is sort of this issue of managing um, the, the position of the pharmaceutical company relative to its intellectual property and sort of the things that result from the marriage of this information science and biology. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, well, um, you know, I take a kind of uh, pessimistic view of uh, our knowledge. That is to say, um, I mean, we can talk, you know, big, like we know what we're talking about, but uh, drug discovery is still uh, basically, you know, playing dice. And uh, you can do all sorts of things to, to try to make your process um, a better problem-solving process such that, you know, uh, you have an increased probability of getting to the promised land, not necessarily the promised land that you said you were going to get to, but some, you know, somewhere. Um, but as for 
you know, being able to sit out with a, a specific goal and just achieve it. I think, you know, virtually random. But uh, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Economics is is a large set of issues um, because there's a you know there's a large intellectual property issue, right? I mean, the way in which the Human Genome Project has been carried on within the public domain, um, I think, is is a sort of essential um, uh, backdrop to to the you know things happening at all. That is to say, the data was made public. And you know, so the open sourcing of the human genome um, has been, uh, I, I, I would say, you know, the key to there being an interesting result. Um, and you know, I think the, uh, the battle between intellectual property and, you know, if you will, open source uh, Ideologies, um, you know, is a creative tension for for the period to come. Put it that way. Well, thank you. We'll save the next questions for later. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> Something that requires many, many, many points of view. And um, it raises so many problems and so many fears and issues that just cannot be addressed from one point of view, definitely. So I, I appreciate your bravery <laughs> to, uh, to address it in a different kind of context than you normally would. Um,